Hey everybody, Mark Ahrensberg here with The Pure Now Show. This is episode number eight. My guest today is Matthew Encina. Matthew is a creative director, public speaker, educator, and all around groovy guy. Super talented, been in the business over 15 years, and now he's out there doing it on his own. He's got a lot of great stories, and he's worked with some incredible clients. Here we go. Hey, Matthew. How you doing, man? Good, good. Nice to be here, Mark. Oh, thank you. Much appreciate you taking some time out to be on the Pure Now Show. We're super excited. We're big fans of yours and uh, a guy of your caliber, an international speaker, an internationally recognized creative director and educator. Uh, the only thing I could think of this morning was, like, how do you have any time to yourself? It seems like you've got a lot going on. You're committed to a lot of people. You're way out there. You've made yourself obviously very available on a variety of levels to people. Uh, how do you balance that all out and, uh, you know, be your cool self? <laughs> Uh, well, the key to that is quitting your job. <laughs> ah. So I don't know if you know, but I uh, I recently, in February of 2021, quit my job at Blind and the Future. So I'm completely solo now. Uh, all of my time is my own, and my only commitments are the ones that I make. And currently, a lot of my commitments right now have to do with the content that I'm making on my YouTube channel as well as uh, a new client project that's starting up, which is going to be pretty exciting for me. Well, that's really cool. So and I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> no, no, that answered all of my question. Uh, uh, I'm a little blown away. Uh, you're obviously, uh, can I ask how old you are? Yeah, I'm uh, 36 right now. So you're a young cat. You're not even 40. You dumped your job. You reprioritized your life. Mm -hmm. You're doing it how you want to do it. Not that you weren't doing it how you wanted to do it before, but now you're really, really doing it how you want to do it. But you had to put in the time mm -hmm. and, uh, and and make those commitments early on. And uh, I, I want to talk about that. I want to know how this whole thing started. Everybody in our business is on a creative journey of sorts. And there had to be that event mm -hmm. or something as a young person, a very young person, that uh, started to steer you in this direction. Do you recall maybe what that event or series of events might have been? You know, it is a series of events early on. Uh, like many people, I recognize and was aware of my own uh, creativity through some of the things that I did as a child, right? I love to play with Legos and I like to design things with Lego blocks, you know, from raw material into something that, uh, a toy that I could play with. So designing my own toys with Legos. I love to uh, watch cartoons like many young boys and young girls and I loved comic books and in those things that I watched those are things that I captured with uh, pencil and paper. I drew a lot of Ninja Turtles growing up, I drew a lot of Wolverine and Spider-Man copying straight out of comic books because I love so much those characters and for whatever reason something drew me to wanting to draw them on paper. So I think in noticing that, it really, I owe a lot to my parents and my family because I think they saw that in me as a young kid and definitely nurtured that. They didn't do anything to stop me from pursuing a, a creative journey or creative career or creative pursuits. In fact, they nurtured it. They bought me supplies uh, whenever they could, bought me more Legos, bought me some paints, bought me pencils, comic books when they could afford it. Um, and that just kept snowballing uh, until I got into high school. High school, there was luckily a specialized art program that the high school had just applied to. And they got a grant. And this grant allowed a few of the art teachers to come together, create a secondary specialized school in my high school, and focus on teaching both uh, traditional art and digital art. So I was very, very fortunate that in ninth grade, I got to sink my teeth into 3D programs, into the Adobe Creative Suite, into animation programs, as well as learn, um, you know, life drawing and illustration. So I got a very rich 
uh, education and exposure to the arts growing up which ultimately it just it just felt like I had to go down this direction you know then going into college I went to art institute first uh, I wanted a bigger challenge and I ended up at uh, art center college of design in Pasadena which I pursued a graphic design degree I focused in motion design um, there I met some very influential people to me um, I met a bunch of colleagues which I would start a motion design company with uh, which we called Born in 2007. And I also met uh, my mentor, Chris Doe. He was teaching at Art Center in 2006 when I was attending. And I took his class three times because it was the best class I uh, that was available to me uh, at the time. So that set me on my way. And for, for many, many years, I focused on working uh, as a motion designer, primarily on TV commercials. Uh, back in the heyday when there were still TV commercials. <laughs> uh, and, and I did that for over a decade and moved up into being a creative director at Blind. And eventually I slowed down on that and moved into education because I found joy in teaching other people. I, I, I love giving value and delivering value to people. It's one thing that drives me. I think it drives many of us. And I think doing the client work, it was one-to-one. -one. You know, doing... Uh, servicing one client at a time. It was so fun for me, delivering a great project, seeing the smile on their face and uh, enjoying the results together. But once I moved into online education, it was one to many. So now I could teach a larger group of people through our platform, which is known as The Future, which I worked at for uh, five years. And then, like I said at the beginning of this call, more recently, I just went on my own. So all of this experience that led up to this point all of this, um, this long, long journey has equipped me with the tools that I need to feel confident to go on my own, to be able to communicate and navigate my way through this world and see nothing but possibilities outside of developing my own career beyond my title, beyond my industry and see what else is out there for me. Well, tell, tell me uh, what it was like you're coming out of school, you've got a lot of good chops, you've got a lot of raw talent already. How did you start to pursue that path on a professional career? What steps did you take to start solidifying that path and, 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 and you know, really immersing yourself into this passion for what you want to do and creating a life for yourself around that? Again, I was around a very good nurturing environment and I was around the right people at the right place at the right time. And during school, this was in 2006 when I decided that I was going to focus on motion design. I knew that I wanted to start freelancing while I was in school, but I knew no one was ever going to hire me unless I had experience. And it's one of those weird catch 22s where it's like, they won't hire you unless you have experience, but you can't get experience unless somebody hires you. It was always this weird thing. And I think it's still a challenge for a lot of young people today. And for me, I kind of backdoored my way into things. I, I was always a good student. Yeah, I'm that student that you hate that always got the A's. Yeah, that, I'm that student that you, <laughs> you can hate in class. But uh, like I said, uh, Chris Doe, who I met, was the owner and founder of Blind. He was teaching at Art Center. I took his class. I did pretty well in his class. And I just asked him, can I intern for your company? And this was in between semesters. And for Art Center, we have three uh, trimesters year round. And there's about a month break in between each uh, trimester there. So in my mind, this would do two things. One, this would allow me to get real world experience and work at a company and at the same time, do it in a short amount of time. So I was being a little sneaky this way. So I interned for Chris for one month. This was my break. And I, we all knew that I had to go back to school after that. So I only interned for one month. But after that one month, what happened was they hired me back as a freelancer. So automatically I had experience as a, an intern and then now as a freelancer. And then uh, shortly after that, I started uh, looking around town at other shops in uh, LA and I, I told them I was available as a freelancer. And then I got hired at another company, which was uh, Belief when they were still around back 
in the heyday 2006. Uh, and I started freelancing there. So now I had two places under my belt that I worked at. And as soon as I graduated college, I had experience, I had my portfolio, I had my reel. Uh, and it was a lot easier for me to start continuing to build that momentum that I did, that I had in school. Well, and that's it. You know, you have to take what you have and just go for it and and develop from there. So you had a few clients that you were freelancing for. You're, you're building up your book. You're building up your experience. When did you decide that you have had enough experience under your belt where you could, you know, do it on your own, take on a few partners and, and go out there and make a name for yourself? That was also in school. <laughs> so I was sneaky in school that me and my colleagues, my classmates there, um, there was six of us. We were all just working on projects together um, for probably the last year and a half of school. And the reason why we did that, because the school mostly encouraged solo projects, like you're your own person, you're your own individual. But we knew just because of our network that that's not how the real world works. Good projects and big projects are done as a group. They're done with teams of people that have different, different specialized talent um, that would ultimately produce the best results. So early on, since we knew this, we formed our own little collective when we already called it Born during school. And we started just doing projects. We started hacking all the different classes that we had and kind of uh, convinced each teacher that, hey, wouldn't it be great if we did this group project, even though that was not the assignment of the class. So we started working together as groups, working on bigger projects, knowing that ultimately that's going to serve our portfolios better rather than um, try to get the grade in the class. Like that wasn't important to us anymore. All that we cared about is that at the end of our term there at Art Center, when we would have the most freedom as students where we have no client to, um, to address or to report to, where we could just have pure creative freedom in school, like we wanted to take the most advantage of that. So we were busy building our book. And at the time, um, we even made a collective reel for Born in 2006. And it was just a collection of all of our student work, but that work got the attention of our network and extended network at Art Center. And the beautiful thing was, we as a collective started getting work as students. And one of the first jobs we did as a collective was for PlayStation, which is crazy that I look back on it now, that back in 2006, PlayStation would, would trust a bunch of snot-nosed kids to do work for them and this was through an agency that just knew of us and you know we just ended up getting uh, everybody's attention and it was very good so that again set us up for confidence and momentum so that by the time that we graduated from school we all kind of went off in our own directions to freelance at different shops mostly to scope out what else is out there but ultimately the six of us kind of kept it in the back of our minds that we were going to do something together and continue to do something together. And then in 2007, no, 2008, I believe, or late 2007, we ended up incorporating because we started doing group projects together. Um, we started freelancing together as a unit and ultimately we incorporated and then formed our company. So by you cultivating this group mentality, did that change anything about the way Art Center operates at all? Did they, did that continue on after you left? Because that's certainly a, a unique presentation that you offered where kind of went off the beaten path of individualized effort and you created this collective and something beautiful blossomed out of that, something new. Uh, was this something that stayed uh, that you're aware of and do you, are you still connected to Art Center in some way where you offer uh, this educational component? Yeah, so um, after I graduated from Art Center and I went back to the grad show and started talking to um, you know some of the um, teachers there and the program directors, they did continue to do more group projects and encourage that. There was a lot more group projects after we left for probably the next 10 years. I'd like to think we had some influence on that. I don't really know. Nobody directly said, oh, because of you, we ended up doing this. But that was a pattern that I started seeing after the fact. So um, I'm glad that maybe some people kind of recognize the power of uh, group projects and 
what that does when more people are involved and you harness um, the the talents of multiple individuals. So that was awesome to see after the fact. Um, in terms of my connection to Art Center, I don't teach there or anything like that, but I do uh, frequently go back there for the grad show just to, again, see old colleagues, uh, see what's going on at the school, and also just scope out new talent in case I need to hire people. Yeah, I mean, that it's like one of the top schools in the world, creative schools in the world. So I mean, it's certainly not hard to find incredibly gifted people as it seems to be a magnet for that. And they certainly produce and offer uh, an incredible education. A few of my friends, I mean, back in the 90s, I was in L.A. You're from L.A., right? Mm-hmm. Where, where in L.A. did you grow up? I grew up in the suburbs, but for the past 10 years or so, I've been moving around uh, different pockets of L.A. So I lived on the west side for a little bit. I lived on the east side a little bit in Altadena, and now I reside in Koreatown. You're listening to The Pure Now Show, a creative podcast for creatives presented by Balance. Oh, cool. Right on. Well, I'm from L.A., so I was there 35 years, and and, uh, that's where my creative life began and uh, mostly ended uh, after I left. But uh, there's incredible opportunity, obviously, in Los Angeles. You're you're so entrenched in Hollywood and entertainment and music. And and because of that um, close-knit circle of, you know, explosive creativity, you had some pretty unusual opportunities. And you got to work with some incredible talent there, can you tell us about this video project, music video project you did uh, for Coldplay? I mean, that's obviously probably, I mean, I can't even imagine this call coming through. I'm sure you probably didn't even believe it was true, perhaps, when you received the call. And then to have this unfathomable opportunity and to do with it what you did which is break down all the barriers of reason and possibility and just going full bore into your creative mode and having to come up with solutions on the fly to support your ideas. I think it's a really fantastic story to tell. And uh, maybe you can uh, let us know how that went down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So in 2014, we got a call from the band Coldplay, their uh, creative director. And uh, who had previous ties with the studio Blind already in the past. I think they had been chatting about previous projects, but nothing ever came to fruition. So in 2014, they had called. They were producing a new album, and they wanted to create a music video for uh, Ink, uh, a new single on that album. And uh, they looked to us to create uh, director treatments. So these are just, what would you do as a director to turn this song into a music video on screen. So we were all given the opportunity, uh, all of us creative directors at Blind. Um, so I pitched in an idea, Greg Gunn had pitched in I- an idea, and then Christo also pitched in an idea. So we all pitched in ideas, different ideas from different angles for how we would interpret this song. At the time, you know, I was, I was, I couldn't even tell you how I felt. I just felt like I wasn't, I wasn't good enough to pitch an idea to them. Like I grew up loving Coldplay. Their their freshman album, Parachutes, had come out when I was just in high school. I think I was a junior at the time, and it was just amazing. And ever since that time, like I've always been a fan of this band. So now that we had this opportunity, it's like ooh. I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if my idea is good enough. And I don't know if whatever I present to them would ever reach um, the same caliber as their music. So even though we were given the opportunity, I started to put some things together. And I think I got nervous about that and anxious. And I almost pulled out of submitting a director's treatment. It would have been just Chris and Greg who would have submitted something. But then... My executive producer, being the good guy that he is, Tobin, uh, he was like, dude, this is Coldplay. This is an amazing opportunity. You're telling me you're not going to pitch an idea on this. 
And slowly, because he's he's a good people person, he kind of reeled me in. He kind of lowered my defenses and talked me off the ledge. And I said, you know what? You're right. This is an opportunity. I might as well just try. So I kind of reevaluated what I wanted to do for the project. And I knew that I wasn't confident in the idea that I had before. So I wanted to outdo myself. <laughs> I wanted to come up with something that was going to be new and exciting that I knew would meet meet their expectation, their caliber of what they produce in music or at least attempt to and outdo myself and things that I've done in the past. So what I ended up pitching to them was not just a music video, but an interactive music video. The thing is, I had never done an interactive music video before. I just knew that they kind of existed out there. There's different pieces of technology and I, I had seen examples of them, but everything was still pretty early on. But I knew that it was a possibility. And just like many of the projects that I pitch on, I just want to present a big idea. And if somebody else can get excited enough to say yes, I will figure it out because that's all creativity is. To me, creativity is taking two things and finding the connection between the two. So because I already knew the possibility of interactive music videos out there and I had an idea of what that, how that technology functioned, I just pitched an idea. Like I, I pitched something that um, I thought would fit the bill and they would get excited about. I submitted the treatment. A few days went by, nothing. I think a whole week or two might have gone by and nothing. And <laughs> for me, I was a little bit relieved. I felt like, you know what? I tried. Uh, you know, I, I did my best and that's all I can do and pat myself on the back. And of course, ring, ring. It was a creative director. He said, they love the idea. When can we start? And that's when the panic started to hit. And that's when I felt like, shoot, now I have to make this happen. And it, it became a reality. It became one of those things where I was like, what have I gotten myself into? So immediately at that moment, I was like, sure, of course, let's let's move forward. Give me a few days to kind of regroup and then uh, we'll get going. And as soon as we hung up the call on there, I started making calls to everybody that I knew, anybody that worked in interactive, anybody that was uh, close to working on things that looked like the thing it was pitching. And I got a few friends on the phone call. I got a few different vendors and companies and I was talking them through and they all said, yeah, that's possible, of course, you know, in the future. Oh, the technology will get there. And so I got, had a lot of those calls where it was like, yeah, it's possible, but it's tricky. And I just did not feel confident with a lot of these different calls. And I just started to feel like, ooh, this might be it. I might have shot myself in the foot. And then I started looking at uh, more different companies. Specifically, I started doing research on the companies who had produced these interactive music videos and I found one. Uh, at the time, their platform was called Treehouse. Uh, it's now called Echo, E-K-O, which the music video is hosted on now. But I gave, I just looked up their email right on their website, their contact us, and I was like, shoot, this is gonna be a cold call, but let me do my best to make the pitch to them very sweet. So I name dropped and said, hey, working on this cool interactive music video for Coldplay. It should be really cool. It's going to be all animated and I want to use your technology. And then within 48 hours, I got a message back and say, that sounds amazing. Let's hop on a call. Chatted with them. Turns out they had the perfect platform developed for exactly the thing that I wanted to do. And it was a match made in heaven. So it was, it was perfect. They were trying to get uh, more examples in the music industry done. And I obviously needed their tech. So uh, played nice with them. And... About a month and a half later, I had delivered an interactive music video, something that I had never done before, but was such an amazing experience to go through and everybody loved it and it was it was so fun. A cold call for Coldplay. That's what you had to do to get that thing dialed yeah. in. And I know That's right. <laughs> I know that they showed up in your office too and and initially uh, the the band members that were there first didn't really respond to your presentation so i don't think you were sure that they even liked it and then of course that that changed right. yeah so, so um 
yeah, midway through the project, uh, the the whole band they visited the office, uh, including the creative director and Chris Martin. And the band arrived first. Um, they reviewed the stuff I presented to them as best as I could, showing the interactive components. But of course, half of the project was still kind of chicken scratch sketches. So I didn't know if one they didn't fully understand what I was trying to explain to them because it was very complex. Or if, you know, they were holding their breath to see what Chris Martin would say. Or if they're just like, yeah, that's cool. Like there's kind of just, it felt they were indifferent about it. They were a little quiet about it. And then Chris Martin walks into the room about 20 minutes later. Uh, and then I present it again. And we're playing it for about 30 seconds or so. Silence. And then he said, I love it. When's the rest of it going to get done? And at that point, I was like, "Okay, good. He's sold. <laughs> We're done. Let's shut everything down. Let's let's stop. Let's let's just keep going." So he's happy as long as you know the main stakeholders are all happy. We don't need to oversell. Let's just stop right here. And I just told him, "You know what? We'll have this done in three weeks." And there was no changes. There was no revisions. It was it was an amazing client to work for because one, the creative was open and I could do anything, but two, because there was zero changes on this project. And that was, wow. if you've worked in the creative service industry at all, you know that that is, that never happens <laughs> except <Yeah>. this once. <laughs> because not everything is wine and roses in the creative <laughs> industry. And oftentimes we have to deal with clients that are super challenging. There was a project that I did I think it might have been around 2015, maybe earlier than that. It might have been 2013. Um, I was working on this vitamin commercial, and we had to do a bunch of animations of like the vitamin and the vitamin bottle. Not anything super exciting. Pretty straightforward, but you know we got plenty of those types of jobs, things that pay the bill. And I always find um, a way to make it fun. For me, I always try to find a way to make it interesting despite the, the content we have to produce. So this particular client um, was very challenging throughout the process, but it was pretty manageable. You know, they would, uh, this person would ask for all kinds of changes and, you know, moving along in the process, we would make them. It's like, okay, she seems to be happy, all good. Then we got to the delivery. This is the week that it is due. And we showed all the finals of everything, everything that we had built up until that point. And for some reason, this person had just snapped and said, oh, okay, well, I mean, that looks all right, but when is it gonna look realistic? When is this gonna happen? And when is that gonna happen? And then all of a sudden I just was taken away. I was like, whoa, you know, we've been working on this for four weeks together. You've seen every instance of this and it's just gotten more and more refined. Where is this coming from? And it was one of those things where I just had to really play it cool. And even though this person was meeting me with a lot of aggression, I had to just slow down and just try and understand why does this person feel this way? What is their true intent that they want to see? And what kind of compromise or agreement can we come up with together that makes this person feel heard and we can both agree is the right way forward? So that was a very difficult conversation to have, but I think after a lot of conversation it, over an hour, we got to a place of understanding. I don't remember where we ended up resolving it. I just remember there was a lot of tension there. But a few days later, we still delivered on time and it was perfectly fine. <laughs> it was just a moment that I was like, whoa, this is the opposite of what I expected. You know, you, you feel like as you move forward in a project, things get more and more refined and there's less and less changes or things to do because you're building it together. At least that's what I aim for. But it just seemed out of left field. And uh, and yeah, that was one of many examples that, uh, that have happened in my career. <laughs> I did want to talk a little bit about the client management because that thing is not something I was buttery smooth at to begin with. And I still will trip up from time to time as I work with clients, but there's character building along the way. Once you deal with one difficult client, uh, that builds a little bit of character and resilience if you're willing to learn from it and if you're willing to do better. And every time you'll find as you live more life, life only gets harder.
So the more obstacles that you, that you choose to face and conquer, the better equipped you're going to be to the more difficult things in life. So just because you have a bad client doesn't mean that, oh, this is a bad client. This is only going to happen once and maybe I'll just quit this job or navigate around it or, you know, I'll bite back and fire the client or whatever that is. It's like, no, if my opinion and my perspective has always been, yes, this is challenging, but I feel like there's a way through this. Let me just understand their intent. Let me understand what they want and not do it in a way where I'm just being a yes man and throwing my whole team under the bus to do extra work for free. That was never the thing. It was always this balance of making sure the other person feel heard, making sure that we come to an agreement together of how we're going to move forward with the project and also let them understand the implications if that means there's more time or money needed because I would never throw my team under the bus to make them do extra work for free. It does take a lot of practice and there's a way to do it without being a yes man, without throwing everybody under the bus, without doing free work, without making other people feel angry, where everybody just needs to feel heard, understood, and there's always a practical way forward if you're willing to work and navigate through the difficult conversations. So our business coach, Kier, who mentored a lot of us at Blind, he said, do you want to be right or do you want to get the job done? And I think that hearing that through him and through Chris just really made a lot of sense. It's like the work is, oh, we had this quote written up on the board um, where we had our conference room and it's like, whether you like it or you hate it, the amount of work is going to be the same. And all those things just like permeated in my brain to think like, let's just stay objective. Let's just get the job done. Um, let's put the feelings aside uh, and make sure that we are delivering the best we can and remain objective and productive uh, as we move through these difficult conversations. You're listening to The Pure Now Show, a creative podcast for creatives presented by Balance. How did it come to be that you were going to uh, start taking on public speaking? What was your inspiration to even get on a stage and start talking about whatever subject matter that you wanted to share? A lot of this has to do with my mentor, Christo, who's the my teacher at Art Center, now the founder and owner of Blind, who mentored me for the past 15 years and still continues to share some gems with me till this day, even though I'm, I'm gone from his company. At the time, he had just starting to do public speaking for a few years. One thing to know about him is he's a hyper learner. He's a constant improver and uh, self-development is so important to him. And the beautiful thing about that is he's not selfish about that. He always gave that back to other people and he did this as a teacher he did this as a mentor to all of us that worked for him and now he does this publicly online through the future so at the time he was already reaping the benefits of public speaking meaning that yes he was shy yes he's an introvert and yes he did not really want to do these types of things but what it did for him in terms of building confidence, learning how to present better, and then growing his network and influence as a result of that, he said, I think all of you, and he was talking to us creative directors, need to do this as well. So he challenged us, and I think this might have been around the end of 2015. He was challenging each of us, because he always set up challenges for us to help us push a little bit further, because he wanted us to get better, not only from a a personal standpoint, but from a professional standpoint as well. Because it's like, if you start doing this, you're going to blossom in your career. You're going to grow more than you currently have. Me, public speaking, being a shy, quiet, introvert guy who's normally behind the camera, behind the scenes doing the work, like this did not sit very well with me. But because I think we were in a group and he was holding us accountable, I was like, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll do it. Chris, I mean, you've never led me uh, down a wrong path. You're usually right about these things. So I said yes. And of course, the universe was listening because it was probably two weeks after or maybe within a month, a friend of mine had reached out and said, hey, uh, our college, Cal State Long Beach, is throwing our own TEDx event. And we saw that you did this cool video for Coldplay. 
would you like to give a TEDx talk on that experience or some part of that experience? I was like, oh, this is, this is the moment. The universe is, has challenged me. And this is probably one of the most difficult places to even begin, which is a TEDx event. And if you know anything about TED Talks, they're very strict in terms of the rules, the format. You have to memorize your talk. It has to be within 18 minutes. And they have all these things that go on in there. So, of course, I had to say yes. Luckily, this there was a six-month span between when they asked me and when the event was. So I, I literally used all six months to practice crafting my talk, kind of reworking it, sharing it with some friends, uh, sharing it with Chris, uh, coming up with the idea, and then eventually... Um, coming up with a whole presentation that I would memorize and practice the months leading up to it and you know give my first big talk but that's what that's what got me on there and and going through that process I felt helped me understand how much work it takes to put together a concise idea and presentation even though I'd already been doing it uh, as a creative director in director's treatments presenting it on stage and entertaining and pulling in an audience so that they lean in and listen they'll react when you want them to react like there was a performance aspect that I, I started to learn through that process and I learned that by studying other people studying other speakers that had just really good presentation really good cadence studying other comedians and see how they set up a joke how they tell a relatable story and then how they use timing where sometimes they'll speak very very fast and then slow down so that you would pay attention to the words they're about to say. And things like that, those are things that I didn't know before, but I started picking up and seeing the patterns from studying many different people and then applying that and emulating that to, to myself and to my own storytelling. So overall, that just made me a much better presenter and storyteller. And since then, I've probably spoken at uh, a dozen other events. The biggest one was in uh, Manila, Graphica Manila, which was in front of 4,000 people. Uh, so that was incredible. That was amazing. But that was also another big test for me. And um, yeah, it just it kept going from there. And I just kept practicing. And I feel like I've gotten better and better. And my last speaking gig was right before the uh, big pandemic closed down globally. It was in uh, Melbourne, Australia, and that was March in 2020. As things were closing down, I was already out there to give a, a talk, and that was the last big one that I gave. Do you think all that cool experience set you up for what you're doing now, which is online education? It looks like you have a lot of fun in your day-to-day -day life that you like to share, like your workspace. You've got this, I mean, we've got a little window of you right now, but you obviously <laughs> have this customized, beautiful workspace that I've watched you develop over time. And uh, you make incredibly engaging videos that are fun to watch. And you're a good presenter because of your ability to present. And uh, what got you on this now video thing? I think it, it goes hand in hand with the uh, public speaking. Because once I realized the joy and value that I brought to others in person on stage and the joy and value that I received in return through this reciprocation and response that I got from those presentations, I realized like how much I have to give. And again, to credit my mentor, Chris Doe, he was the one who first pushed me to do public speaking. And he was also the first one to push me to be in front of the camera like we are now to teach what I know. And this is in the early days when he was running the, the school, a YouTube channel, which has now become the future, which is all about creative education for creative entrepreneurs. And he just pushed me. He's like, look, you have so much to give. I want you to teach something on the channel. And of course, just like many things, there's a little internal resistance. But because he's been such a good mentor to me, I said, OK, uh, I'll figure out something to teach. And so I started working on this video. It was all about how to create a nice composition. And I recorded that video probably 26 times. It was, it was bad. I didn't like the way I looked. I didn't like the way I sounded. I didn't sound like myself. My voice kind of sounded funny, a little nasally. I was like, I don't like any of these things. 
and that I kept questioning like is this material good and I kept editing it over and over and over again and then at a certain point he uh, I think he might have pushed me and said hey uh, so where's that video <laughs> like uh, I'll have it ready then and then we just hit publish at a certain point I was like it doesn't matter I can keep tweaking this I'm kind of tired of working on this thing let's just hit publish what's the worst that can happen and so we published it on the channel and I wasn't expecting much and then I started getting feedback in public feedback comments and things like oh I needed to hear this oh man this guy really knows his stuff more of this guy please and then I started seeing the comments flooding in and then I realized at that moment it's like shoot I do have a lot of things that I've uh, learned over the years that are valuable to other people that are special to other people all the things that I take for granted that I do day to day as part of my process as part of my work there are plenty of things that people have yet to be exposed to those and I should do my best to share that because my mentor had done so much for me and has been so generous to me I should reciprocate and do the same for others so I started making videos on the future channel and over time, um, I stopped doing the client work at Blind and we went full throttle uh, at the future as a company. Not everybody followed us, most of the company came along. And then we all started working on creating content, educational content that's gonna be valuable for people who are creative entrepreneurs. And I spent you know, a good five years trying to teach everything that I knew in different ways, experimenting with formats um, from a docu-series called Building a Brand, which was awesome, which was documenting the first meeting till final delivery of working with a real client, showing their goals and expectations to the final results of what we did. And that was a phenomenal project to not only direct, but be a part of as a creative director in the trenches working on that project. And then there are many other little videos here and there that I, I made. Um, all the while, working under the future with Chris and everybody there, that gave me confidence to think, you know what, I'm pretty good at this video thing. What if I start experimenting and making more personal content on my own? And I started exploring that. First, I made a little intro video about myself, trying to just make a, a, a video a calling card, as you will, like a one minute intro. Uh, so that because I, I don't like introducing myself I think a lot of people don't like talking about themselves but if I had a video that I could just send to somebody it's like oh you want to get to know me in a minute here you go and I could just keep sending this video out which would be my calling card uh, to let people know who I am what I do and that did pretty good and uh, eventually I started making more and more content and w one thing that I made was a desk tour video basically I was remodeling my office at home because you know, I started doing some work from home and I wanted to document the process because one, I found it so enjoyable to build and design thing. And I consume so much content of other examples out there, other people who are building things. And I just saw it as such a cool niche, uh, a cool thing that I wanted to see, you know what, can I do this in my way? All the many years of being a creative director and creating content for TV and other people, can I do this on my own? And that's so why I made something for fun. And then that video ended up blowing up and I think it might have reached a million views within the first year and now it's at eight point something million views. And ever since then, that video gave me so much confidence to keep creating things on my own. That was happening in the background while working at the future until February 2021. Everything kind of just lined up for me. I, I had finished 2020, which was a very difficult year for so many people. Um, but for me professionally, I felt like, wow, I think I've climbed the mountain here, both at Blind doing client service work. I think I've climbed the mountain um, doing what I can at the future as an educator. And this thing that I've been building in the background, my own channel and my personal brand, is just starting to blossom. What I earned in 2020 when I looked at my books, like after I was doing my taxes and looking at all my revenue for the year, I realized that all of my side hustle made the same amount as my full-time job. So with that, I realized, shoot, I think this is a sign. This is a sign for me to see what happens if I go out on my own. Because if this is what happens when I'm just doing this in the background, what happens if I fully commit to myself, the things that I wanna do and the things that I wanna explore? And so I made the very difficult decision over many months of kind of looking at the pros and cons. It was just, it was just time for me. 
And when I told Chris, my mentor, my boss, he was like, you know what, this makes perfect sense. And to be honest, I was surprised you haven't gone on your own sooner because you were capable years ago. And it just, it took me a while to get that confident and to feel like all the boxes are checked. I'm ready to take off my training wheels and go solo. Well, you don't seem like the kind of guy that makes hasty decisions. I think you like to be well-informed, well-educated. You like to have all the information, all the data available before you jump into something overly spontaneous, too hasty. And, and your career has obviously proven that. And it's so cool that you are now doing your own thing. Still at a very young age, you got all the time in the world on your hands and you can do it however you want. I am curious how the pandemic has affected you personally and maybe the flow of your work and just you know, how you've been operating over the past couple of years. Uh, in 2020, up until now, obviously I spent so much time at home and that did many things for me, both good and bad. I'll start with the bad things first. One of the, the cons of that is I was missing all of the in-person interaction with all of my coworkers, with my friends and stuff like that. So I think because I didn't see my coworkers, that also helped me make the decision to leave because it felt like I was no longer getting all these beautiful in-between moments with people and I was just at home staring at my screen doing the work and delivering stuff week to week but not getting that nice interaction and especially not getting the interaction from my mentor. Like it was so hard to get on the books with Chris not because he wasn't available because, but because you know when we work together like we'll have lunch together and we'll have conversations like it's, it's just part of the job. Where I, I think being all at home, it's like, well, to get somebody on the call, you kind of have to schedule something with them. And I'm like, well, if I don't have something to talk about, it's kind of weird to just book something. And I don't want to waste this time. So I think that deteriorated a lot of the relationships that I had. Um, obviously, we all still keep in touch and I'm still good friends with all of those people. But it did it did take its toll um, on those relationships. So that, that was one thing that I think was a negative. On the positive side, because I was at home, home became so important to me. So all of a sudden, you know, I'm here 24 hours a day and I'm looking around and it's like, mm, I wish our living room was more cozy. So I started working on it, started designing, started building things in there. It's like, oh, you know, what? I can document this. Oh, my home office. I work in here all the time. Might as well give it a little facelift. Let me work on this. and Let me document that as well because that's fun for me to share on the channel. My bedroom, yeah, might as well update that. Plants, yeah, I got into plants. So like all of these things that were being part of my day-to-day -day life, I just wanted to document it and share it because I wanted to see is like all that content that blew up before, was that a fluke or is that something that I can actually repeat? Are the people that are watching my YouTube channel and seeing my content, are they in it for me or like, was it just that one thing that I made? And luckily, I've been able to prove to myself that people are interested in all these different facets of me. And the more that I share about myself, the more people I draw in and connect on a more personal level. Like the last video I made was a bookshelf tour, which essentially was just sharing all of my influences growing up until now. So sharing some of my favorite books and music and things that I did, shooting with film, um, and I've in that video, I found so many comments where people felt a little bit closer to me. It was like, oh my gosh, I used to do that too. Or shoot, I totally collected Ninja Turtles. Or shoot, this was my favorite comic book series. Uh, the one that you chose like that, that is the jam right there. So the more and more I share about myself and do it in my way, the more I realize that people are showing up because they resonate and connect with my story and who I am as a person. So it's just reinforcing a lot of um, the things that I've been fortunate to discover and been able to explore. If you were unable to do what you choose to do now, is there any other vocation or type of work that you would be interested in trying? I think because I have 
what I consider pretty good people skills. I would love to be maybe in the music industry, working with artists, helping projects come to fruition. I don't know, like if it, I feel like I'm, I'm really good just in between the goal and the difficult problem to solve. And I like being in the middle there where I can help generate ideas or connect people or connect things together that need to be there in order for that thing to happen. I could probably see myself as an alternate career. And because of all your vastness of experience and immersion in this industry, what kind of advice would you give not only to young people that are coming up in this business in a totally different time, also people that have been in the business for a while. So I have this uh, book of quotes. So whenever I hear a boat, uh, a good quote from a movie or a person or a podcast or a book or something, I write it down. And there was one quote that just, I felt so connected to uh, when I heard it. And it was here by Quincy Jones. It says this, once a task has begun, Never leave it till it's done. Be the labor, great or small, do it well or not at all. So for me, what that meant is just, if you choose to do something, give it 100%. Make a choice, then commit to it. I think so many of us, and I've done this myself throughout my life, where you kind of commit to something, you only have one toe in, but you haven't fully committed and jumped in. And that leads to mediocre results, that leads to surface level knowledge, that leads to surface level results. And I've noticed that whenever I've committed some, to something like the Coldplay um, moment, it's like I was rewarded because I took a very big risk and then I worked my butt off to get that to become what it is. And I've seen that happen time and time again is that when you just put your head down and you do the work, the results will be there, but you have to commit. So I think it's really important not to be coy about your commitments uh, and not to be shy about that, but to go all in on those things and, and not waste the opportunities because we all have a finite amount of time. And if you choose to do something, do it well, try to make the best of it and uh, don't complain. I, I think those are big things that um, I think was was a big life lesson for me. So that that's a big thing that uh, I think is important that I've seen throughout my career. And the second lesson, the other piece of advice that I would give is don't forget about yourself. We use all of our creative magic for our clients, for other people, to service other people, to make cool commercials, to make great pieces of content. But very seldom we use that creative magic on ourselves. And I think it's so important to have either a hobby, if it's something small, where you get to express yourself creatively because you're not always going to get that from the job. You're not going to get that working on vitamin commercials, but you might get that, you know, playing the guitar without expectations, without putting any pressure on it other than creative expression. Maybe you like to draw, maybe you like to illustrate, maybe you like to do other things, but don't forget to use some of that beautiful creative magic that we all have in, in us and use it towards something that you want to do, you want to learn, and something maybe that ultimately might be another career path or a side hustle for you moving forward. So those are the two lessons. Like if you commit to something, give it your all, go 100% and, and, and don't stay surface level. And the other thing is don't forget to use some of that creative magic for yourself. Matthew, it's been awesome to have you on the Pure Now Show. Your life experience, your creative experience, your attitude, your personality. I can see why you like doing videos. I can see why you're getting the response to your videos that you get. You're, you're a great guy and you have a lot to offer. You've obviously been put on this planet for the rest of the world to reap benefits from. And, uh, and I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much, Mark, for having me on the show. And thank you, Hi, for inviting me on here. And I, I'm glad I could share uh, this space with all of you. If you enjoyed the Pure Now show, you can check out more episodes at balancestudio.tv or anywhere fine podcasts are broadcast. Pure Now is produced and engineered by Hi Ha Dang. Special thanks to our media sponsor, Maybe, and iDesign.vn. Thanks so much for watching.